you've heard about it many times before. It's the one thing that's more certain than taxes. The whole range of human vision is bounded by it. It brings to a close all activities, hopes, joys, plans. The good book names it, it is appointed unto men once to die. But what then? What follows death? We can learn about the past by the study of history. We can understand the present often by current events. But who can penetrate the future? It's an enigma. It's a mystery. It's an impenetrable wall of darkness. Unless, unless there is an authority that can be trusted to tell us what lies beyond the veil. Well, one man out of the billions who have lived has penetrated the veil and come back to tell us about it. In the first epistle to Corinthians in chapter 15 and verse 6, Paul the Apostle, who saw the risen Christ, said he appeared to about 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain, but some have fallen asleep. So there were hundreds of people in Paul's day alive who'd seen the resurrected Christ. And what's more, he didn't just appear for a blip of a moment and then disappear. He was on earth for nearly six weeks, 40 days. And after that, he ascended and sent down the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, the beginning of the new era. You've heard of the catacombs. All those thousands of kilometers of galleries underneath the city of Rome, where the Christians buried their dead. The Romans burnt theirs. They didn't believe in resurrection. But there are about 7 million Christian burials in the catacombs. And every one of them is a testimony to the faith of the early church that Christ rose from the dead. And because of that, all who believe in him shall one day rise from the dead. You know, you can explain a puddle in the road by talking about a summer shower. But you can't explain the Gulf Stream that way. You can talk about the Grand Canyon, but it's no use saying that millennia ago an Indian dragged his stick along the surface of the ground and caused it. What is the cause of the Christian revolution? What transformed 11 broken-hearted men into zealous missionaries going to the ends of the earth at the risk of their lives? They all died in martyrdom except one. What caused it? The risen Christ. You know there was a church built at Jerusalem the very place where he was martyred. That's rather difficult if it was a put-up job. He had lots of enemies in Jerusalem, all the scribes, the Pharisees. Why didn't they produce the body? The Roman soldiers were on guard at that tomb. How did they explain it? They were bribed to say the body was stolen away at night. But they didn't believe it, and neither did anybody else. Where's the body? It was transformed into the risen, resurrected Christ. We have four famous writings that describe the event. We call them Matthew, 
Mark, Luke and John and no one can read them without prejudice, without realising these are honest, straightforward, truthful documents. Some of the things they record would never have been written if the stories were invented. One of his own twelve disciples denied him with cursing three times. Another one betrayed him. They all fled from him, forsook him when the Roman soldiers came to Gethsemane. They record that his relatives at one time thought he was mad. That's not the sort of thing you invent for the Messiah of a new religion. They said his own forerunner, John the Baptist, sent a message. Are you really the Messiah that was to come? There are so many things in these books, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, that bear the hallmark of truth. They even record that Christ said he could not foretell the day of his second coming. They record that he prayed that the cup of suffering might pass from him and that he cried out in death, God, why have you forsaken me? All these are marks of truthfulness. There are no comments thrown in to anticipate opposition, other opinions. There are no anathemas on the people that murdered Christ. They don't magnify the miracles to make a big thing out of them. It is so straightforward. Take that one line in Mark 16, 7. Go and tell his disciples and Peter. Why and Peter? Because Peter was broken hearted and the risen Christ was sending him a special message. It's okay, Peter. I love you and I always will. Yes, these stories tell the truth about the risen Christ. Thousands upon thousands of early Christians risked their lives. Many endured martyrdom because they believed in the resurrected Jesus. And if you and I believe in him, death is no problem to us. A moment's sleep and then resurrection at the second coming of Christ. But you know, we're all pretty dull. So God has given us a thousand testimonies in nature to the coming resurrection of all the dead. I've mentioned this before, but it's very important. You must understand it and then you'll have hope in the darkest days. The sun has a sinking spell. Every day disappears, but it comes back again as though in resurrection. The moon dwindles away to a mere sliver of light, but later it becomes full again. Trillions of seeds lie buried through winter, and then there's a green shoot, and then a plant, and then fruit. And the best of all, the one that appeals to me and I think will appeal to you, is the butterfly. Millions of butterflies on every continent, they can fly from continent to continent, but they were all once grubs, worms, earthbound worms that we call caterpillars, which towards the end of their earthly existence had a burst of vitality and movement, but then stopped and shrouded by a chrysalis as in a tomb. They seem to be dead. But gradually the chrysalis cracks, opens, and there comes out not the caterpillar. Now there comes out a butterfly with wings. Now this formerly earthborn creature can fly into the heavens from world to world. All oh, my friends, 
all of nature tells us about the resurrection. Jesus said, whoever believes in him shall never die. Death has been abolished for the believer. It's only asleep. He also foretold the day is coming when all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and the righteous will rise at the resurrection of the just and the wicked shall rise to the resurrection of judgment. Read about it in the fifth chapter of John. In verse 24, our Lord says, If you understand what I've done for you, that I loved you enough to take your sin and pay for its penalty to show that I love you. If you accept that, you already have eternal life. You have it now. You've passed from death to life. You're accepted in the beloved. You're complete in him. That's good news indeed. God help you, my brother. God help you, my sister, to rejoice in this the greatest of all historic facts. Christ is risen.